for the introduction. I'm not sure if I can ma match uh, the, this announcement now. Uh, yeah, I also would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak here. Uh, I will talk about some relatively recent joint work with uh, Sergei Starchenko. Some of you had seen uh, earlier versions of this talk, so I, I apologize for that. But hopefully there is something new for you as well. Um, Okay, so before I say anything about model theory, I would like you to consider a purely combinatorial statement, a purely combinatorial situation. So we have, uh, we are given a bipartite graph. With, so we have two sets, A and B, let's say disjoint, uh, and we have a edge relation. So R is a subset of A times B. Uh, and we will say that a pair of subsets A prime, a subset of A, and B prime subset of B, uh, is homogeneous, or are homogeneous, when I want to specify my edge relation, if uh, either uh, I have all the edges between A prime and B prime, or I have no edges whatsoever between A prime and B prime. So in the picture, we have this A prime, B prime, and uh, in the first case, we have all the edges. I don't think I drew all the edges, but we have a lot of them. And in the second case, uh, there are none. And a very basic result, uh, classical result in graph combinatorics, is due to several people, Kavari, Sos, Turan, Erdos, uh, said that uh, you can always find a pair of homogeneous subsets of logarithmic size up to a constant. So no matter which graph you start with, if uh, both A and B have size N, you can always find a homogeneous pair of uh, approximately logarithmic size. Uh, in essence, this is a very basic kind of uh, Ramsey phenomena. So either one or another. Uh, now, this bound is known to be optimal in general. There, there's a combinatorial argument which shows that you cannot do better for, for arbitrary graphs. Uh, however, if your graphs happen to, to come from some kind of geometric situation, uh, one can do much better. And this is going to be the topic of my talk today. Uh, so I want to describe some kind of geometric situation when ca one can do much better. Uh, first, uh, first, the context. Uh, so I will say that a set A, a subset of some power of reals, d r to the d, to the power of d, uh, well, it's, everyone knows this, I imagine. So such a set is, semi is called semi-algebraic if, uh, if it can be defined uh, in terms of polynomial equalities uh, and inequalities, as a Boolean combination of polynomial equalities and inequalities. Uh, most basic geometric shapes or in real space uh, are semi-algebraic. So, of course, first of all, every finite set is semi-algebraic. Um, but also, all kind of things like balls, lines, boxes, basic geometric shapes are semi-algebraic. Uh, and I will say that uh, the description complexity of a semi-algebraic set A is bounded by T, if, in fact, it can be defined uh, by, by a Boolean combination, which involves, at most, uh, T polynomial inequalities and the degrees of all the polynomials involved are bounded by T. Uh, some examples of uh, semi-algebraic graphs or hypergraphs uh, to consider, which will be relevant for this talk, are, first of all, one can look at the incidence relation. So we have, uh, we have the set of points and we have the set of lines, which are views encoded by their parameters. Um, and then the incidence relation, a point line on a, on a line, is a semi-algebraic graph. Uh, similarly, one can define uh, the edge relation of our graph to represent pairs of circles in a three-dimensional space that are linked. When by linked, I mean that, uh, well, that uh, they, they are linked, basically. Uh, <laughs> and uh, similarly, one can consider various multidimensional generalizations. One can look at uh, parameterized families of semi-algebraic varieties uh, having non-empty intersection. Or you can look similarly at multidimensional versions of that. So these are some examples to keep in mind. Uh, and a very uh, seminal result uh, about regularity for semi-algebraic graph is due to Allen, Pach, Finchas, Radojcic, and Scharrer uh, from 95, which tells you uh, the following. It tells you that if you fix T, the description complexity of your set, then you can always find some positive epsilon such that whenever you have a, a semi-algebraic graph, 
of complexity bounded by this fixed T, then for any pair of finite sets, A and B, uh, one can always find their subsets, A prime subset of A and B prime subset of B, uh, such that the size of A prime and B prime is at least the epsilon fraction of the corresponding sizes of A and B, and the pair A prime and B prime is R homogeneous. So instead of logarithmic uh, size, you get actually a linear size. Uh, moreover, each of these sets uh, is actually cut out by a semi-algebraic set uh, of complexity, which is bounded in terms of t. So I'm not saying what this function is precisely. Uh, it doesn't matter for now. But uh, there is some function depending just on t, such that not only we can find this homogeneous subset of much larger size than in general, but also these homogeneous subsets are, in fact, uh, coming from the same geometric category the, at the edge relation. So they also seem algebraic of complexity bounded in t just in terms of t. Uh, this result and various improvements and uh, generalizations of it, they have uh, numerous applications in, the, uh, gram graph, uh, in geometric combinatorics over reals. Uh, some applications, some of them I'll actually touch a bit later on. Some applications are, involve some algebraic regularity lemma, certain incidence questions, various uh, unit distance problems, higher dimensional Ramsey, etc. So there are quite a lot of applications. Uh, but of course, to, to model theorists, this, uh, this raises a quite natural question. So we have this result for semi-algebraic graphs. Now, uh, is it spe specific to semi-algebraic? Or, for example, can we allow more complicated graphs? Okay. For example, if I want to define my edge relation in terms of exponentiation, or some analytic functions. And also, what about graphs which come from periodic geometry? This is question one. And question two is, can we look at uh, more general measures? So if I, in the previous example, I just count points. But what about uh, looking at some more general measures? For example, Lebesgue's me measure on over real, so hard measure, in the periodic case. Uh, turns out that model theory provides both uh, context and methods for such generalizations. Uh, and let me try to describe the context first. I won't say much about the methods, but let, let me describe the context. Um, OK, so back to this previous result about semi-algebraic graphs. Uh, it can very naturally be reformulated as a statement about definable sets in the structure of reals, in the structure of, in the field of reals. So namely, uh, I wrote the same exact property. Uh, but now I avoid speaking explicitly about, uh, about description complexity of my sets. Instead, I just uh, look at uniform definability of the sets. So I want to call this property star. So it's a property of a first order structure, arbitrary first order structure. And my property says that for whenever I have a definable relation R, uh, then I can always find some positive epsilon such that uh, for any finite subsets A and B of the corresponding powers of my model, I can always find uh, A prime subset of A and B prime subset of B uh, of size at least epsilon uh, fraction of the size of the original set, uh, such that the pair A prime B prime is R homogeneous. Moreover, I want to require that both A prime and B prime are in fact uh, definable or they're, gi they're given by the intersection of my, set a and, of my sets A and B with certain definable sets, where those sets, S1 and S2, uh, are definable by a certain formula which depends only on the formula defining R, not on the choice of the parameters. Well, it has to depend on A and B uh, the By an instance, by an instance. Did, ah, by do, an instance. I don't say it, sorry. Yeah, OK, right, by an instance, yes. So I mean, uh, Sorry? By a formula, well, by, yeah, by, 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 by the formula. Uh, so uh, there is a choice of parameters which, uh, yeah, is right, yeah. Is, is S1 also dependent on the infinity of R? No, so it, the, the, the epsilon depends just on R, just on the shape of R, on the formula that is used to define R, not on the parameters. So that's a, that's a, the, that's a crucial point. So I want to say that if I, ha if I have a similar algebraic set, then uh, my formulas, S1 and S2, they don't depend on the choice of the coefficients of my polynomials. They just depend on the, on the shape of these polynomials. Uh, OK, so we have this property, which may be true or not true in an arbitrary first-order structure. 
Uh, and it's natural to ask what other structures satisfy star, satisfy this property, this strong uh, regularity principle. Now, there was some result in this direction. Uh, namely, uh, there's a theorem due to Sogatu Basu from 2007, which says that if one looks at topologically closed graphs in no minimal expansions of real closed fields, then they satisfy this property. So there is a topological assumption, and uh, you're an expansion of a real closed field. So for example, one can look at the expansion of the field of reals with the, by, by, exp by the exponentiation function and uh, restricted analytic structure, and uh, some minimal structure. So any graph you can define there will satisfy this property star. On the other hand, uh, as I had remarked in the beginning, the logarithmic bound is optimal for general graphs. Uh, now, uh, this implies uh, that any structure that satisfies star uh, is in fact what is called an IP. Uh, so a certain model theoretic tameness condition, which can be equivalently phrased as saying that uh, all uniformly definable families of sets have finite VC dimension. I'm not going to elaborate on this, but it's easy to see that the, any structure satisfying star is an IP, just because if you're not an IP, you can encode an arbitrary bipartite graph why a, why a definable edge relation. And since logarithmic bound is optimal for general graphs, uh, you see that you fail this situ linear bound. OK, so, so we know that the field of reals satisfy it, and we know that any structure satisfying star is an IP. Uh, is every structure satisfying an IP satisfy also satisfies star? So that's not true. Uh, Okay, so first I want to remark that if we don't require definability of, of, uh, of these homogeneous pieces, then any structure which can be defined in a structure satisfying star also satisfies star. So in particular, if we, if, if we ignore the definability of uh, my homogeneous pieces, the moreover part, then, uh, then the field of complex numbers satisfies this relaxed star as well. However, uh, however one can look at finite fields. Uh, and it turns out that uh, star fails in an algebraically closed field of positive characteristic. Here's a, uh, here's a sketch of an argument. So for a finite field, so we fix P, and for a finite field of Q, by PQ we denote the set of all points uh, on the plane over this finite field, and uh, by LQ we denote the set of all lines. And uh, we consider our edge relation of our graph to be the incident, incidence relation between points and lines. Uh, now, there's a known, it's a known fact that the bound uh, on the number of incidence relations given by this formula is optimal for finite fields. So it's a known result in combinatorics that in incidence bounds uh, or finite fields are uh, worse than over fields of characteristic zero. Uh, so this bound is optimal. Now, using this bound, one can demonstrate the following claim. One can show that for any fixed delta bigger than zero, uh, for all Q large enough, if we take an arbitrary set L0, subset of lines, and if we take an arbitrary set P0, subset of points, uh, such that the size is at least delta times Q squared, then there's always going to be a point from this set and a line from this set, such that this point lies on, on this line. So this shows that uh, we can never find uh, a large homogeneous subset such that uh, there are no edge relations between any two points there. On the other hand, uh, line is determined by two points. So it shows that you can neither have uh, two large sets such that they are always in the incidence relation. So this shows that uh, this property star fails. And, uh, and since every finite field of positive characteristic P can be embedded into the algebraic closure of FP, it follows that uh, star fails in the, in the algebraic closed field FP bar, even without requiring the definability of homogeneous pieces. So it's a very explicit failure of my property star in an in a infinite uh, algebraically closed field of positive, in an algebraically closed field of positive characteristic. Uh, so what happens here? So we know that in the field of characteristic zero, this property holds, in the field of characteristic P, this property does not hold. It turns out that there is a model theoretic notion, an existing model theoretic notion, which uh, turns out to be precisely the right distinction between these two kinds of phenomena. Uh, so let me describe you the class of structures. 
to which we are going to generalize this property star. So distal structures. Distal structures were introduced and studied by Pierre Simon uh, quite recently in order to, for, for purely model theoretical reasons, in order to capture the class of purely unstable NIP theories. Now, the original definition, which I'm not going to give you, was uh, rather abstract. It was in terms of uh, certain properties of indiscernible sequences in your structure. Uh, it turns out that one can give a combinatorial characterization of distality, uh, which I'm going to give you. Uh, so I write a theorem definition. So the theorem here is that this definition is equivalent to the original definition. But what is written here, you should think of it as a definition of distality for this talk. So what is a distal structure? Uh, and an IP structure, M, is called distal if and only if for any, de any definable family uh, of the form phi of xb uh, of subsets of M, there's another definable family, psi of xc, where c varies over a certain power of M, such that for any element A of my structure, a singleton, in fact, and any finite set B, uh, I can always find a certain c uh, so a tuple of elements of this fixed finite set B, uh, such that if I look at those elements of my family to which A belongs uh, or does not belong, I can, if I look at this specific set psi of xc, then it turns out that belonging to this specific set psi of xc completely determines the behavior of A with respect to, with respect to uh, my family of phi's. So let me recast this in the picture. So I have a formula phi of xy. Distality means that given it, I can find another formula psi of xz, so no parameters here, so it's a uniform procedure, such that the following happens. Whenever I pick a point, there's no, uh, okay, whenever I pick a point A, an arbitrary tuple, and I have my family uh, of phi of x b, i, where b i varies over my finite set b, arbitrary large though, but finite. Then I can always choose a very small definable set containing my point a, given by an instance of psi with parameters from b, from this finite set b, such that the set is contained in all those elements of my family that contain my point A, and at the same time it does not intersect any element of my family which, uh, to which A does not belong. So it implies the phi type of, uh, of, my, of my element A over big B. So it's a locality principle. Uh, it's a for what is psi of phi? Uh, so in this, uh, in this notation, psi of xc implies the phi type of A over large B. So if you, so if you give them, I actually fix A, then you find the fixed A. No, if I, I find... You fix like every A. Given phi, I find psi, such that for any A and any B, I can find C. So C and C determine the phi type of this particular element A. Right. And we, we, we B. Right, exactly. Yes. yes. So it's a, it's, a, it's a strong form of uniform definability of types. Um, all right, so this is the definition slash theorem. Now, sorry? So, so k depends just on phi. So it's just, uh, k is just a uh, number of parameters, basically to represent the number of parameters in psi. All right, so now we have this definition, which structures are distal? So it turns out that there are quite a lot of distal structures, and in a way, one can think of distality as a very weak form of cell decomposition. So intuitively, every structure satisfying a half-decent cell decomposition is going to be distal. This can be made precise, for example, by demonstrating that all weakly or minimal structures are distal. Uh, so for example, real closed-valued fields are distal. Uh, now, any p-minimal theory with column functions is distal. Again, because there is a periodic cell decomposition of the NOF, and one can demonstrate that uh, this structure satisfies this combinatorial property. Now, certain topological differential valued fields uh, turn out to be distal. Uh, you'll hear more about this, I think, in the, in the talk of Francois Poin. Uh, 
about such fields. Uh, and another example is the ordered differential field of trans series. One can deduce from the recent work of uh, Aschenbrenner, Van den Dries, and Van der Hoeven that this is a distal structure. Another example is that one can take a nice pair of distal structures. Then this pair is going to be distal itself. So a nice pair of real closed fields is going to be distal. So these are some examples of distal structures. The motivating example is the case of PEDX in this situation. All right, so this is our class of structures, distal structures. Now I want to describe you the, uh, to you the class of measures with which we work. Uh, so Kistler measures. OK, so it, when you look at definable subsets of, uh, of a certain fixed power of m, it naturally has a structure of a Boolean algebra. So one can talk about, uh, about measures or finitely additive measures on, on, on this Boolean algebra. So a Kistler measure mu over structure m is a finitely additive probability me measure uh, on the Boolean algebra of uh, definable subsets in a fixed variable x. Uh, and uh, one can look at the space of types over M, the compact space of types over M, which is the stone dual, uh, so the, set, the, the space of ultra filters in our Boolean algebra. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, well, it's very easy to see by standard methods, some standard methods on measure theory, that this finitely additive measure can always be extended to, to countably additive Borel probability measure on the space of types. And one last remark is that uh, this bold M is going to be uh, a saturated elementary extension of my structure, a monster model of the theory of my structure. Um, so it's a universal domain uh, in, the case of, uh, in the case of the field of complex numbers. Or uh, if, you, if you think of real cost fields, one in particular, one adds infinitesimals, infinitesimals with respect to those infinitesimals, and so on. So we want to have enough solutions for, for, for families of equations in our structure. Uh, so we have this monster model, bold M. And now I want to define the class of measures, uh, a, certain class of, a certain important class of measures, which was studied quite intensively recently by, by several people. Uh, so a measure mu over an NIP structure M is called generically stable. If there is a unique, uh, extension of this measure to a Kistler measure or the monster model of my structure uh, unique uh, among the, those extensions of our measure, which are invariant with respect to automorphisms fixing my small model M. So, it's, so, so among the invariant measures, uh, my measure mu is completely determined by its restriction to M. <coughs> this is one way to define it in an NIP structure. And there are various equivalents uh, to generic stability. There are various ways to characterize generic stability. The one which is uh, mostly relevant for, for our talk is, uh, comes from a combination of uh, the classical theorem of Apnik and Chervanenkis in computational learning theory and its model theoretic interpretation from the work of Khrushchevsky, Pila, and Simon. Uh, well, so we have the following. If you have a generically stable measure, then they can be uniformly approximated by frequency measures. What does it mean? So it means that if you fix a formula phi of x, y without parameters, and you fix a positive epsilon, the error up to which you want to approximate, then you can always find some number n such that for every generically stable measure mu over m, we can find some finitely many elements of our structure, a 0 up to n minus 1, such that whichever parameter b you choose, if you want on to, to to learn the, the measure of uh, phi of xb, all you have to do is up to epsilon. All you have to do is you have to count how many points uh, this set phi of xb contains among those ais. Well, you have to normalize it. So the, one can think of this uh, property as a uniform version of the law of large numbers. Uh, law of large numbers tells you that if you want to know a measure of a set, well, in a certain setting, that if you want to know a measure of, of your set, you can start picking points at random and eventually you'll get a better and better approximation of the measure of your set. The point here is that if your family uh, of sets has finite VC dimension, then you can choose one set of points which in fact approximates any element of your family, any set from your family. The same finite set of points gives a good approximation for any set in your family.
Right. So this is the class of generically stable measures. Some examples of generically stable measures involve, well, first of all, obviously, counting measure. So in any, in any, in any theory, if you look at a measure fixed on a, uh, concentrated on a finite set, it's going to be automatically generically stable. Uh, Lebesgue measure on, on, uh, on the interval 0, 1, uh, when I mean uh, viewed as a Kistler measure, so its restriction to definable subsets, is generically stable. Now, higher measure on a compact ball over p edx is generically stable. Another example would be when you have uh, a definably compact group in a non-minimal or, or a, in a non-minimal theory over p edx, then it admits a unique gene variant measure, which is generically stable. All right, so this is, these are some examples of generically stable measures. So now we have both ingredients of our context. We have, uh, we have the class of structures, distal structures, and we have a cl our class of measures, generically stable measures. And uh, the first theorem uh, tells you that this property star holds in an arbitrary distal structure with respect to, an ar to, to the class of generically stable measures. So here's the precise statement. Uh, we start with a structure M, a distal structure, then it satisfies a strong form of star, which tells you that for every definable relation uh, R, uh, we can find a positive epsilon such that uh, for all generically stable measures, mu uh, on the corresponding power of, uh, of M, and mu on, the, uh, on M to the power of Y, can always find uh, some sets as one and as two, which are uniformly definable, uh, depending just on the formula used to define R, such that the measure of S1, the, the new measure of S1, and the new measure of S2 are greater than epsilon, and the pairs are homogeneous. So this is one implication. The other implication is that... <laughs> Measure, yeah, look at the, this remark. Here. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So this is one implication. The other implication is that, in fact, if you look at an arbitrary structure and it happens to satisfy star, not the strong star, the basic star, with respect just to counting again, then this structure is distal. If it satisfies star for all definable graphs in it, then it's distal. So it's equivalent. Distality characterizes this strong regularity property. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, so if I have a, so let's look at the next remark. If you look, uh, if you want to get, if you want to obtain the finite counting measure, uh, the, the finite counting version, we have two finite sets and we take two measures which just count points in those sets, traces, I mean, sorry, so for every set it's measures just the number of points from your finite set that it contains. Normalized by the number of all. Right. So this will be the same situation here. If you have a, it's exactly the same. Uh, <laughs> Uh, right, so, so the, the, the basic counting example, it follows from, from this more general statement. Uh, okay, one remark that I want to make, sorry. No, no, it doesn't depend on the That's a crucial point, of course, because you want the same format to work for all finite sets. For each finite set, you have a corresponding measure which counts it. Yeah, this is a crucial point that this formula, like, like it is written here, only depends on, uh, on, the R, on the formula defining R. It's all uniform with respect to the measure. Okay. Uh, one remark I want to make is that... Uh, uh, so, so this result, it applies to p edx for a fixed p. Now, the point is that this, uh, the problem with fp, so we had seen that if, uh, if you look at sufficiently large finite fields, you can never find an appropriate constant so that they would satisfy this property star. So the point here is that in a piadic for a field for a fixed P, the, this trouble with larger and larger finite fields 
it gets treated just by, by increasing the constant in the, in the situation. So this thing is not uniform in P. This property is not uniform in P. Uh, and, uh, okay, using this basic result, uh, one, can one, one can amplify it in various ways. One can obtain it. Density version of the statement, when you actually know what kind of homogeneous pair you're going to find, the one with a lot of edges or the one without edges, or uh, one can also generalize this to hypergraphs, and there are some other generalizations. Well, this, this, this is a formula for the It's a formula for the Yes, it's all formula by formula. We have to say, well, this is just our... If you speak to the very hard... Sorry? You said you have measures only, measures only on... Uh, on the corresponding power of... Uh, on the measures on... Uh, on all right, so, so this is the first statement, the first result. Um, now, we have this regularity, this strong form of regularity for graphs definable in digital structures. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to actually use it in order to get some kind of decomposition uh, for graphs definable in digital structures. Uh, well, I want to obtain a certain regularity lemma. So first of all, again, forget about model theory. Let's go back to, <laughs> to, to, to general graph, uh, graph combinatorics for a minute. So the classical result of Simiredi tells you that in some sense, all sufficiently large finite graphs can be decomposed in a bounded number of pieces such that between any pair of pieces in those partitions, it behaves like the edges are more or less uniformly distributed at random. Uh, here's a precise statement. It tells you that if you fix a positive epsilon, you fix a certain error epsilon, then you can always find a number large k depending just on this epsilon, such that for any finite, so this is the most basic version of the regularity lemma. Uh, so we have this large k uh, such that for any finite bipartite graph, R, we can always find the partition of, uh, of its parts, A and B, into, into K many parts, non-empty parts, and we can find a certain set sigma, a subset of pairs uh, of indices, such that the following properties are satisfied. First of all, each of these partitions is of bounded size. So the size of each of those partitions is bounded by this large K. Second property is that this set sigma, which you can think of as a set of good pairs, it contains almost all pairs from this partition. So an explicit way to say it is to say that if we count all the pairs which belong to my set of good pairs sigma, then it's almost everything up to epsilon. And the last statement is a regularity. So it tells you that whenever you take two indices i and j, a good pair of indices, and if you look at an arbitrary subset a prime, b prime, of those pieces of my partition, then the density of edges between these two subsets is up to epsilon the same as the density of edges between the whole pieces of my partition. So sets, uh, uh, edges are in some sense uniformly distributed. Now, what does it mean? Let me recast it with a picture. So I have an arbitrary graph. This is not quite arbitrary, but uh, think of it as an arbitrary graph. Uh, what I do, so I mean, this is the incidence matrix. So this is my set A, this is my set B, and I put a dot when there is an edge between the corresponding x and y. Uh, so what the regularity lemma tells you is that you can partition your graph into a bounded number of pieces, and you can throw away a few pieces. So you see on those pieces, uh, uh, edges are not uniformly distributed. I can throw away a few of them, and then I have this nice uniform picture. So this is regularity lemma at a glance. Uh, it's a very important result. Uh, has infinite number of applications in extreme graph combinatorics, in additive number theory, in computer science. Uh, there are also various versions of this result, but okay, let's just stick to this most basic version. Uh, so it's a, it's a result about all graphs, non-trivial theorem about all graphs. Which is, so there has to be some catch. So the catch is that uh, 
The size of this partition is astronomical. It grows as a tower of exponents uh, in terms of uh, 1 over epsilon. So the smaller my error gets, the larger the size of this partition has to be as a result of Gower's, and it grows astronomically as an exponential tower. OK, it's natural to ask what happens in restricted families of graphs again. So if you have graphs which come from some algebraic or from some geometric situation. Uh, and here's a little summary of recent result in, results in the literature. Uh, so this, this is some kind of classification of regularity lemmas. And surprisingly, it has a lot to do with model theoretic classification of structures in which uh, we are looking at them. So here, here are several examples, and then I will T say something more about the last one. So the first, the first uh, instance of this regularity lemma for restricted families of graphs is a result, recent result due to Tao, where he has an improved regularity lemma for algebraic graphs of bounded complexity in large finite fields. So essentially it amounts to looking at definable graphs in pseudo-finite fields. And in, in his situation, so this is the statement, uh, this is, sorry, this is the statement of my uh, regularity lemma. Now, what are the improvements? In the case of uh, algebraic graphs over finite fields, the improvement is that pieces of partition are themselves algebraic, so they come again from the same geometric category, the edge relation. Uh, there are no exceptional pairs, and the bounds on, on, on regularity are much stronger in this case. This result is based on some important results about definable subsets of pseudo-finite fields due to Shadzidakis, Van den Dries, and McIntyre. Uh, now, this the result of tau is quite amenable to, to general model theoretic techniques. So there are various generalizations now uh, due to Khrushchevsky, Pillai and Starchenko, Macpherson and Steinhorn. Uh, second class of examples is the result due to Lovas and Segedi, uh, which applies to graphs of bounded VC dimension, or in IP graphs for, for, the, for the sake of this talk. Uh, so what they show is that if you look at graphs where the edge relation has bounded VC dimension, one can, in addition, get, make your density arbitrary close to 0, 1. So you either have almost all edges between any pieces of partition, or almost no edges. And uh, besides the number of pieces of the partition, it's much better now. So from exponential tower, it, it's now it goes down to a polynomial. Two special cases are the case of stable graphs by Maliaris and Shellach. So they show, moreover, that there are no exceptional pairs in this situation. And another uh, special case is due to Fox, Gromov, Lafork, Naur, and Pach. Uh, and it deals with semi-algebraic graphs of bounded complexity. So the same setting again, and the key ingredient, uh, key ingredient of this regularity lemma is this uh, property star. Now, we have this property star for arbitrary, generically uh, stable measures in distal structures. And we can generalize this last result. Uh, to this larger setting. So here's, here's the th second theorem. So let's, let's see what it says. So it says that if we have a distal structure, and we have again a definable graph, uh, and we fix an error epsilon bigger than 0, then it turns out that we can always find a number k, so the bound on the size of the partition that we have to look at, um, this k depends on epsilon, and it depends on the shape of my formula. Sorry, it's, it's not phi, it should be r, so it's a formula defining my graph. It's, uh, it's r. Uh, k depends on epsilon and r, such that whenever we have generically stable measures mu and nu, we can always find a uni uniformly definable partition of my structure, of the corresponding source of my structure, uh, which are uniformly definable in terms uh, of just r and epsilon. And again, we can find a set of uh, good pairs such that the partition is bounded by this fixed k. The measure of the set of good pairs uh, is uh, almost 1 up to epsilon. So the measure we look at the, on, we look at the m m to the power of x times m to the power of y here. So we have to look at a, at a product measure of, uh, of my measures mu and nu on the separate sorts. One can always take this uh, product measure to be generically stable. And in fact, in a distal structure, this is going, there's a unique way. There's a un uniquely determined product measure in this situation. Sorry.
you would be uh, negative. Yes. And there's a... Uh, Consorts X and Y. Oh, you mean you're smooth? You're smooth? Yes. 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 Uh, okay, and moreover, so here's the, here's the quite drastic trend thing. In this situation, not only we have the density on, on each pair of the partition is uniformly distributed, but in fact, for each pair of pieces of my partition, I either have all edges or no edges, literally. So it's not just a density approximation. On each pair of pieces of my partition, I either have all edges or no edges. And again, the, the bound on the size of... Uh, of the partition is polynomial. So in some sense, it's an ideal uh, regularity lemma. So it's a generalization of the semi-algebraic case uh, to, 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 the distal, to the distal situation. So I want to point here that this picture, all these cases, they are orthogonal. They are non-intersecting. And uh, the stable case and the distal case, they are two extreme cases uh, of, of, of an IP structures. So it's very natural and interesting to understand if one can combine this somehow and uh, if... So what are two extreme cases? Sable and distal. These are two extreme cases of an IP structures. So for each of them, we have a certain improved regularity lemma. The question is, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the combination? Uh, so we have this. And another application of this uh, property star that I want to mention um, concerns a certain, certain conjecture uh, in extreme graph theory, so-called Erdős-Heinel conjecture. Uh, in this, so now, this time, I have a normal graph. So not a bipartite graph any longer. I have a, I have a proper graph. Uh, an undirected one, and uh, in this case, again, I will call a subset V0 of, my, of the set of my edges of my graph homogeneous, well, if it's a clique or an anti-clique. Now, I will say that a class of finite graphs, curly G, has the erdos heinel property if I can find a positive delta such that for every graph from my class, it has a homogeneous subset of size, at least, this, the size of G to the power of delta. <coughs> so one can think of this as an abnormally large homogeneous set. Like, like, we, like I have mentioned before, normally it's, homo uh, nor nor normally it's logarithmic. So this, this erdos heinel property tells you that for graphs in your class, in fact, you have a polynomial lower bound on homogeneous subsets. Uh, it's a general fact, it's a form, I mean, it's a formal impl implication that uh, whenever you have a, a class of graphs, uh, G, which is closed under subgraph, oh, which is closed under subgraphs, and such that every element uh, from, this curly, from this class curly G satisfies star, so I, I forget about definability of my pieces now, I just talk about quant quantitative bound, uh, ha having linear, linear, linear homogeneous subsets of linear size. So linear bound for bipartite graphs implies a polynomial bound for undirected graphs. So it's a formal implication. Now the erdos heinel conjecture, it says that for every finite graph H, if you look at the class of all H-free graphs, then it has the erdos heinel property. So this is the conjecture. It's widely open. There are, there are some papers on the archive which claim to prove it. It's not, it's not so clear what the status of this, but it's, a, it's an open conjecture and so far. And quite, quite few classes, uh, quite few families of graphs satisfying this uh, property unknown. So the, the, the point of what I'm saying here is that now we know that this uh, star holds for arbitrary graphs definable over p edicts, for example. Uh, and like I have said, if we ignore the part about the uh, uniform definability of pieces, then any structure interpretable in a distal structure is going to satisfy this uh, linear bounds. So from this one can conclude that we have a lot of new cases of graphs which satisfy the Erdős-Heinel conjecture. 
For example, one can look at quantifier-free definable graphs in arbitrary, close, uh, in arbitrary valued fields of characteristic zero. This is due to the fact that you can always embed such into an algebraically closed valued field, which you in turn can em embed into a real closed valued field, so, which, you, which you can, sorry, which you can interpret in a, in a real closed valued field, uh, which we know is weakly or minimal, so, so, so it's distal, so, so satisfies the star. So this follows that the bound holds here. Uh, so this is another applica application, and there are more applications in, in progress. There are a lot of questions here, but the point of this talk was to demonstrate that this is, in fact, model theoretic property. Uh, we have this equivalence between a known model theoretic property and a certain property in combinatorics, and that these results can be obtained and the theory can be developed at, uh, at the generality of uh, distal structures. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Are there questions? I was given a mic. I'm not sure I've turned it on. It's just the bar. Is there some uh, serial yeah, yeah. Some serial stable structure we can talk about in this uh, Is there some? Well, there are not. Yeah, the theory is actually quite well developed well, 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 because there are none. <laughs> <laughs> no, any distal structure has no stable part whatsoever. Oh, oh sorry, oh, sorry, this is not what I'm sorry. Okay, no, you, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, I apologize. Yeah, so, so in general, no. In general, no. Yeah, oh, okay, sorry, what I, the remark I was going to make uh, is, a, is, is to a more stupid question. <laughs> this is a good question, but the remark I was making is to, to, was an answer to a stupid question that I had in my mind for some reason, that, uh, that Distal structures are always unstable, they have no stable part. This was one of the main reasons actually for introducing this property. But uh, to answer your question, I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. It's a property which is not closed under redux, of course. Uh, distality. It's a property which is not Right, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, okay, so the, so far there's one result, that this property star without definability of pieces holds. This is one, one, one example, maybe. Of. Another, another example is that uh, from, from this, uh, from this uh, counting in the finite fields situation, one can see that, in fact, any field definable in digital structure has to have characteristic zero. But uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there could be something. Yes. Uh, yes. Just on, on that point that Kobe asked, there's this, there's this old theorem of Alistair Lachlan from a long time ago, that, uh, which is related to this. Pardon? Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> I hear you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so there's, just, there's an old theorem of Alistair Lachlan, which is related. To, and the theorem is that the, it classifies the stable structures interpretable in, dense, in DLO. What's the classification? What? What is the classification? It's precisely the, what is it? It's precisely the totally categorical, trivial oh, I see. structure. So, I know, just it's, it's a special case of, of I, right, I think, right. you know what I mean? I so, so maybe there's some generalization of, of this to distal, from DLO to distal. I see. I don't know, okay? No, no, right, I mean, the, yeah, this is. Other <laughs> <laughs> questions? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Alex, you're a categorical, only the stable. Trivial. Sorry. Alex, you're a categorical, only the stable. Anything else? Okay. Well, let's say five again. Thank you.